Hello, BookTube. I've got a tiny little book haul for you here. I figured that's only right after all the monster book hauls that I've been unloading on you. But I should give you a tiny one. Because after all, you're not here for the huge quantity of books. You're here for me. Isn't that right? <laughs> so I have two books I want to show you. One was handed to me as a gift. It was never in a box to begin with. It's this thing. The Autobiography of Mr. Spock. <laughs> the Life of a Federation le Legend. This is edited by someone using the pen name of Una McCormick. And it is the story of Mr. Spock all the way to the end of his life. Uh, that is Spock from the J.J. Abrams movies. That's Leonard Moy in the very last rendition of the character. But the, uh, the book also does what all of these books do, which is to de-age and Photoshop uh, studio photos of actors involved in order to get them at different periods of their life. Like, for instance, using a childhood photo of Leonard Nimoy as a childhood Spock. <laughs> but also de-aging photos to give us a marriage photo of Spock's parents, Sarek of Vulcan and Amanda of Earth. Incredible. Just incredible. And what this book is, I think there are a couple of other, there are a couple of other, yeah, great, just great photos all in the middle. Uh, what this book is, is uh, just what the title says. It's a part of a series that, these, that has been happening in the Star Trek continuity. You've had the autobiography of Jim Kirk, the autobiography of John Lee Picard. There's one for uh, Catherine Janeway. Uh, this one very much sets up one for Dr. McCoy. That would be wonderful. The, the, where they purport to be the life story as written by the figure involved. My main complaint with them as a series has been their uniformity. If the, the powers that be in the society or in the media were able to convince some of these famous figures in, in Federation history to write their autobiographies, those autobiographies would read very differently from each other, right? They wouldn't read the same. I, there's an effort being made here to sort of capture something like the voice of the individuals involved, but it's not strong enough. This is a case where I, stro I strongly suspect the presence of powers that be at Paramount saying this is permissible and that's not. When you can imagine, I've dreamt for years, for decades, of writing a book called I, Kirk that was Jim Kirk's autobiography. I, I dreamt for decades about doing that, about writing that book. Mine would have been 600 pages long, and it would not have read anything like the autobiography of James T. Kirk that I read in this series. It wouldn't have been anywhere near as careful or elliptical. Uh, naturally, I consumed this in one gulp. I'm not 100% sure that it falls under the heading of Book Trek 2021, the booktube event that I'm taking part in, where, where we're reading Star Trek fiction iteration by iteration. So we, we spent August reading the original series. And we're spending September reading The Next Generation. And this book is Spock's life that he writes himself uh, in the Vulcan tradition. Apparently, all Vulcans, there's a Vulcan tradition of writing your autobiography. I think that's a wonderful tradition. We ought to have it in America. Uh, but the context of him writing his life story is that he is sending it. He is writing it. He is addressing it all throughout to Jean-Luc Picard. Not anybody else. Jean-Luc Picard is the, is the recipient of this book the addressee of this book. And I'm thinking, does that make this next generation? Could I talk about this as part of Book Trek 2021? I haven't decided. I'll ask my co-host, but I love this. I just love It's a geek fest for a Star Trek fan. I didn't love it as a book. I don't think with this or with the autobiography of James D. Kirk, I don't think I could read it as a book. I honestly don't. And that's hard to admit when you are an actual professional book critic. I don't think I could read this as a book. I'm just too... I'm just too invested in the character. That's all. I'm just too invested. I, like, for instance, I did read the John Luke Picard volume as a book, and I read the Janeway book as a book. But this and Kirk and McCoy, if the McCoy volume shows up, I no, I don't think so. I tremendously geeked out to it. I'm not even. I don't know that I'd even go so far as really to say critically that I enjoyed it. I don't think I was. I noticed it in that way at all. So I don't know what I could say about it if I talk about it for book track. But oh my. Oh my, <laughs> I have lots to say about it. I just don't know where or how or to whom. You know, I guess the way, one way to do it, 
would be, I think Mark Richardson got a copy of this as soon as it came out. I'm willing to bet that he glommed it, just absorbed it like a sponge the same way I did. Maybe a, a Zoom conversation with him about this book would work. I don't know how I could review it. Maybe I'll give that a try and see. I don't know how I could do that. Probably this is an occasion for a Steve Reed's entry. My late lamented literary blog, Steve Reed's, that went on for 10 years. Uh, and that I never officially canceled. Steve Reed's is not canceled. It's just in abeyance. I could bring it back and write personal reflections about books in between writing reviews for Open Letters Review. I could do that. That's entirely possible, and this would be a foremost candidate. On Steve Reed's, my late lamented literary blog, I had an ongoing feature called Towards a Star Trek Bibliography. And everything that I wrote about Star Trek was under that heading. It was all about the progression of Star Trek writing. I originally started doing Towards a Star Trek Bibliography chronologically. And then I, I used that title to bounce around to whatever new release I was writing about. I could do that for this. I'll think about it. But that is, that is one book. Certainly, I want to bring to your attention. This is in bookstores now. The Autobiography of Mr. Spock uh, that I got as a present from a very unexpected source. Uh, and then we have a book package. So we have two books, not 20, not 25. I forgot to mention in yesterday's epic uh, Brattle mail haul, <laughs> a Brattle book haul that I did, we had an epic 20 book uh, book haul yesterday at the Brattle bookshop. And I forgot to mention that that was the edited version. That was that that book haul that that enormous Steve pyramid yesterday was not including the books I got as gifts for some of you that I couldn't show on camera. It was even larger. The the, the stuff I staggered back with was even larger. Uh, but anyway, what have we got here? Okay, what on earth? Okay, this is uh, an October release. This is Margaret Verbal. It's by Margaret Verbal, and it's called When Two Feathers Fell from the Sky. Please, please let this not be about horse diving. Please let that be the case. I could not sympathetically read a book about horse diving. Uh, those of you, some of you won't know what, most of you probably won't know what I mean. It's long since outlawed, as well it should be. It was a barbaric and universal feature of fairs, county fairs, state fairs, circuses of any kind. Uh, what is this about? Is this a novel? Louise Erdrich meets Karen Russell in this deliciously strange and daring original novel from Pulitzer Prize, Pulitzer Prize finalist Margaret Verbal. So she was a, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Okay. Uh, so what is this book? Margaret Verbal is an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. What does that mean? Some of you out there will know for sure. What does that mean? Does that mean she's not of Cherokee blood, but the Cherokee Nation has accepted her? as an official member of the Cherokee Nation? That, is that what it means to be enrolled? I almost want to say that I know what that means, but I don't. I need help from one of you. I have an old friend who is an Arapaho who has mentioned that term in passing, but it's been six decades, so I don't remember. I'm wondering what that means. Um, her first novel, Maud's Line, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. And her next novel, Cherokee America, was a New York Times notable book, and she lives in Lexington, Kentucky. Beautiful, Lexington, Kentucky. All right, so let's see what this is. Two Feathers, a young Cherokee horse diver. Oh, no, it is about horse diving. Well, I should probably tell you what that is then. Horse diving is exactly what you see on the cover. It's exactly what you think. You lead a horse to a gigantic diving platform way up in the air and dive them. That You teach, torture the horse until it is willing to launch itself into thin air and land in a gigantic uh, pool of water. Oh, okay, well, let's see. Uh, he, Two Feathers is on loan to Glendale Park Zoo from a Wild West show and is determined to find her way in the world. Two's close friend at Glendale is Hank Crawford, who loves horses almost as much as she does. He is part of the high-achieving, land-owning black family. Neither Two nor Hank fits easily into the highly segregated society of 1920s Nashville. Lots of historical research, I bet, went into this. When disaster strikes during one of two shows, strange things start happening to the park. Vestiges of the ancient past begin to surface, apparitions appear, and then the hippo falls mysteriously ill. Okay. Regardless of what I think about horse diving or what I think about a typical book cover copy, the hippo falls mysteriously ill is designed to hook you. It certainly just hooked me. <laughs> At the same time, two... 
too, dodges her unsettling, lurking admirer and bonds with Clive, Glendale's zookeeper and a World War I veteran, who is haunted, literally, by horrific memories of the war. To get to the bottom of it, an eclectic cast of park performers, employees, and even wealthy stakeholders must come together, making When Two Feathers Fell from the Sky an unforgettable and irresistible tale of exotic animals, lingering spirits, and unexpected friendships. Okay, well this is going to have a huge promotional blitz in mid-October, so uh, historical fiction that is not on your typical well-grounded patches of historical fiction. This is going to be a little bit different. So probably you'll be seeing this in your bookstore. Probably you'll be hearing about it. I, I will read it come October when I get the finished copy, but I do not want to read a single line in this book about how the horses liked it. I've read way, way too much fiction, historical and otherwise, about horse racing, in which the author implies or has characters that are sympathetic state outright that the, or the horses enjoy it. They don't. No animal that was ever paraded for the, for the delectation of a paying crowd in America or anywhere else and then tortured for fun enjoyed it. None of them enjoy it. They were slaves. They are still slaves. They are made to do this for a paying crowd because the punishment, if they don't do it, is torture. I really don't want to read this spectacle defended in any way, by any character in this book who is supposed to be sympathetic. It's okay if you have a thoughtless, brutal, horrible villain of the piece say, ah, the horses love it, and the crowd eats it up. If you have a villain say that, that's fine. But I don't want to be told in the course of this book, or have it implied to me, that I have to agree with Simon Legree. I don't. <laughs> and no book, no matter how well written it is, is going to make me. So I'm really hoping that I don't encounter that, that I will be going into this with, you know, as you could tell, with my hackles a little bit raised, not towards the author, and not towards the, uh, the story. The story sounds absolutely fascinating. A mix of the kinds of dorky, by, in the byways historical research that historical fiction writers love to do, and also a genuine plot. I'm up for that, absolutely. The only thing I don't want to read here, and I find it hard to believe the author will do it, the only thing I don't want to read here is any kind of even implied justification of this horrific practice. So we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. I will, we will revisit this in October when I get the finished copy, and then I'll read it and let you know. But in the meantime, you have this coming. This is coming to your bookstores, When Two Feathers Fell from the Sky. And this is already in your bookstores. The Autobiography of Mr. Spock, the latest in a series that I can recommend. I do recommend these books. They are, to coin a phrase, fascinating. <laughs> None more so than the original cast. For me, I'm very much, very much going to want to have, you know, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, their autobiographies, even if they're not the books that I myself would have written. My I, Kirk, I've written at various times in my life hundreds of pages of that book, and oh my, it is not anything like the book that was authorized by and, uh, and, and licensed to Titan Books. It was nothing like it. It was far, far more interesting. <laughs> But this book is still, if you are an original Star Trek fan, you've got to read it, and it will touch you. Uh, and if you are, and you've read it, I have a million things to say to you about it. But I'm going to try and see if I can work those into something written for the public. That'll be a challenge. But anyway, that is a small, circumspect book haul. Okay? It's not 40 minutes long. It's not 25 books. It's small and circumspect just to keep my hand in. So I'm going to wrap this up, and I will see you soon. <laughs> Thank you, book two.